Hello and welcome to the Secular Buddhism Podcast, a podcast that presents Buddhist teachings, concepts, and ideas from a secular perspective. You don't need to use what you learn from Buddhism to be a Buddhist. You can use what you learn to simply be a better whatever you already are. I am your host, Noah Rochetta, and let's jump into today's topic. This is episode number 179. The topic I have in mind for today comes from the opening lines of the Dhammapada. The Dhammapada is a collection of sayings of the Buddha and perhaps one of the most widely read and best known of the Buddhist scriptures. According to the Theravada Buddhist tradition, each verse in the Dhammapada was originally spoken by the Buddha. You can read the Dhammapada translated on access to insight.org. There are various translations. You can purchase it as a book, but you can also find it online. So the opening line of the Dhammapada says, mental states are preceded by mind, have mind as their master, are created by mind. Now, again, this depends on which translation you're reading. There are a few different translations. I like Gil Fransdale's translation of the Dhammapada, where he says, all experience is preceded by mind, led by mind, made by mind. Speak or act with a corrupted mind, and suffering follows, as the wagon wheel follows the hoof of the ox. All experience is preceded by mind, led by mind, made by mind. Speak or act with a peaceful mind, and happiness follows, like a never-departing shadow. To me, the essential lesson, or the essential message, is that the mind determines whether or not we suffer. I think this is a lesson in psychology, and it drives home the importance of getting to know our own mind, the importance of paying attention to our mind, and perhaps more specifically, paying attention to our thoughts. From a Buddhist perspective, thoughts are interdependent with actions and with words. In fact, it is only when our thoughts, words, and actions are in harmony that we have the conditions for inner peace. Our words and actions are driven by our thoughts, and therefore, thoughts play a vital role in learning to understand why it is that we say and do the things that we say and do. The Buddha taught that we are the owners of our actions. And we're reminded of this with the teaching of the five remembrances. If you'll recall, the five remembrances are first, I am of the nature to grow old. There's no way to escape growing old. Two, I am of the nature to have ill health. There is no way to escape having ill health. Three, I am of the nature to die. There's no way to escape death. Four, all that is dear to me and everyone I love are of the nature to change. There's no way to escape being separated from them. And then five, my actions are my only true belongings. I cannot escape the consequences of my actions. My actions are the ground upon which I stand. Now, this fifth one, I think, works really well with the topic of today's podcast episode, this notion that we cannot escape our actions, or we cannot escape the consequences of our actions. I think it's true, the expression that actions speak louder than words. I think it's also true that words perhaps speak louder than thoughts. However, it is our thoughts that serve as the foundation for both words and actions, and therefore it makes a lot of sense to me that uh, we would use thoughts as the starting point in the practice of getting to know ourselves. So consider this, our perception of reality starts in the mind. We experience reality through our senses, and when our brain uses the information from the sense organs to understand the world around us, it kind of paints a picture of reality. In addition to sight, hearing, touch, taste, and smell, which are the five classic senses, from the Buddhist perspective, we have the mind that produces and senses thoughts, feelings, and emotions. In the same way that my nose can smell and my mind can process the experience of smelling, my mind will attach a feeling to the experience of smelling. And that's how I go from the simple experience of smelling something to smelling something that to me feels like a good smell or a bad smell or a, a smell that I like or a smell that I dislike. 
So that's happening in the mind. You know, my hand can touch something hot and my brain will sense the pain and it'll pull my hand away. The reality in my mind is that 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 gets created is this notion that touching hot things hurts. My eyes, they're capable of seeing a certain spectrum of light. But outside of that spectrum, my eyes might send information to my brain to produce a reality that says, um, there's nothing to see here, it's dark. And I think the important thing to know is that our reality is interpreted through our senses and therefore will always be relative to how our mind perceives and what data comes through the sense organs to our mind. So why is that important to know? Because again, my reality is my reality, but it's governed by my senses. So consider the case of hearing and and our ability to hear something versus another species, let's say a dog, for example. What a dog can hear and what a human can hear, we have two different ranges of ability to, to hear sounds. So where in my reality, I may say it's silent, there's nothing, you know, I, I don't hear anything. A dog would say, no, there's a very loud sound going on here. And that's just the, the nature of, of how sensing works. Or consider seeing, you know, if I were to look at, at a spectrum of light, I may, I may like, like looking at a rainbow, I may say, oh, I see seven or eight colors, whatever I see there in that spectrum. Where a gecko, for, for example, their eyes are 350 times more sensitive to color than ours. So they may look at something and say, no, there's a, an incredible spectrum of light that's going on there that we just don't perceive it that way. So sight, hearing, touch, taste, and smell, these are senses that get filtered through the brain. Our brain uses the information from the sense organs to understand the world around us. And therefore, our mind is like another sense organ. It's, it's the one that pieces everything together, and it paints a picture that we end up interpreting as our reality, my reality. So the mind uses tools to help make sense of what we experience. Words are one of the most widely used tools that we, we've inherited from our, our culture and our society to help us make sense of reality. But remember, words are limited, and we are bound by words and the meaning that we've, that we've given to them. And I think this is a really fascinating thing to understand about myself, the idea that words are what we've come up with as humanity in our attempt to express the inexpressible. And here's a thought experiment that I like to do. How would I make sense of an experience if I didn't have words to use in my thoughts, or a variation of that. What are my thoughts without words? You know, I I think for most of us, for a lot of us, it's common to think of thoughts. Thoughts are words, but they're words that stay in my mind rather than the words that come out that end up being said. You know, when we think of the correlation of thoughts, words, and actions, thoughts and words are similar. The thoughts are internal and the words are external. But think about what what is a thought without words. If I didn't have these words in my mind, if I had never been taught language, I had no concept of any word whatsoever, what would my thoughts be like? I don't know. I don't know that I can know, but I like to play with this as uh, as a thought exercise to try to understand first, what are thoughts? How, how would I even describe thought? Because I recognize that thoughts are the use of words, again, in the attempt to express what is inexpressible. So for me, I like to consider how miraculous life really is. You know, if you think about it, you suddenly just wake up and, and you're here experiencing what it is to be alive. And the miracle of life is that, that we're alive. I think against all odds, against all statistical probabilities, it's like we just suddenly opened our eyes and found ourselves here experiencing what it is to be alive. And there's a quote that I want to share real quick from Richard Dawkins in his book, Unweaving the Rainbow, that kind of illustrates the, the, the miraculous fact that we're even alive in the first place. So the quote goes like this, open quote, We are going to die, 
and that makes us the lucky ones. Most people are never going to die because they are never going to be born. The potential people who could have been here in my place, but who will in fact never see the light of day, outnumber the sand grains of Arabia. Certainly those unborn ghosts include greater poets than Keats, scientists greater than Newton. We know this because the set of possible people allowed by our DNA so massively exceeds the set of actual people. In the teeth of these stupefying odds, it is you and I and our ordinariness that are here. We privileged few who won the lottery of birth against all odds. How dare we whine at our inevitable return to that prior state from which the vast majority have never stirred. Close quote. I encountered this a long time ago, and I remember having that deep sense of, of appreciation for the fact that I'm alive, for the fact that I'm here experiencing what it is to be alive. And I believe that life is an experience to be had in a similar way that art is intended to be something that you experience. I feel like being alive is enough. Everything else is just icing on the cake. Being alive means I get to experience the entire range of human emotions, of uh, potential thoughts and, and feelings. And I get to experience everything that my senses will allow. You know, when you see a beautiful landscape, and I do this all the time when I'm paragliding or traveling, but especially paragliding, because you get a really neat perspective. Imagine, you know, if you've flown on an airplane, the airplane kind of just takes off and it goes up really high. And even from up there, you look out the window and you, you tend to want to take pictures and, and, you know, capture what you're seeing. Well, imagine being able to decide how high you want to you be. We don't go anywhere near that high when we're paragliding, but we go to heights where it's like, wow, I can go right up next to this cloud or I can go along the cliffs of this mountain. I can get right where I want to be. And I'm always finding myself wanting to capture that. So when I see a beautiful scene or a beautiful landscape, I take the picture in hopes of capturing the experience. But as you all know, a photo never does justice compared to the actual view. And I think that's one of the key lessons here. The experience of being alive, trying to describe our perceived reality, everything's going to fall short. Nothing's going to hit the mark. Nothing ever will. And yet we'll still try. You know, I, I try to capture the photo. I try to capture the video to convey the experience of what it was to be there seeing that or, or to be there flying. And I think that's what we do in our day-to-day -day lives. We're always trying to describe our reality, both to ourselves and to others. And, you know, when, when we listen to or a, a song, you know, correlating this again to art, when we listen to a song, we, we simply enjoy the experience of listening to it. We don't need to know the meaning behind it. We don't need to know who composed it. We don't need to know who wrote the lyrics or why the lyrics were written that way. Can those things be known? Yeah. It, with music, sometimes those things can be known, but they don't need to be known. You can, you can appreciate the beauty of the song by simply experiencing it. I think painting, paintings are, are similar. You could encounter an anonymous painting and look at it and you could extract, you could have a, a really neat experience looking at a painting. Let's say it's, it's a painting that you don't know why, but it just brings you to tears. You would have no idea who painted it. You don't have to know who painted it. You don't have to know the meaning behind it. Why did they paint it? Because it doesn't have to do with that. It has to do with the experience you had looking at it. That's on you. That's not on, it doesn't matter what the meaning was. You gave it your own meaning. So with all this, getting back to the, the key message of this particular podcast episode, we inherit the consequences of our actions. And our actions start with our thoughts. Our thoughts can ultimately lead to one of two scenarios. Scenario one, we experience more unnecessary suffering, both for ourselves or others. Or scenario two, it leads to experiencing greater inner peace. And to me, this is really important to know. It's that what I think 
actually matters. So the question is, what do I think? And perhaps a variation of that could be, why do I think what I think? So observing our thoughts, there's a, there's a direct correlation between the understanding of, of the role that our thoughts play and the suffering that we experience or the inner peace that we experience. And when I talk about suffering, I want to make a clear distinction between pain and suffering. Think of pain as pain is unavoidable. Pain is the first noble truth in life. Difficulties arise. But suffering is not. Suffering is not unavoidable. The teaching of the two arrows in Buddhism is the understanding that pain is the first arrow, right? You just, you're walking along and you get shot with an arrow. Suffering is you taking the second arrow and poking at the spot where you just got shot with the first arrow. In other words, suffering from our aversion to experiencing pain. So we have pain and suffering. Pain is unavoidable. Suffering is not. Now, I like to imagine that there are essentially three realities that I continually live in. And I'm sure there are more than three, but here's three that I can think of that correlate well to this overall notion here. And that is the reality of how things are the reality of how I want things to be, and then there's the reality, of, the reality of how I think things should be. So think of those as three different realities that we spend time in throughout our day. The first one is how things are, right? And these are, this is governed by my perceptions and sensations, and that's it. So I can be sitting here, and suddenly there's a strong smell. A skunk walks past the window, right? and I'm experiencing a strong sensation of a smell. That is the reality of how things are. I smell something, and it smells really strong. Then you have the second reality, the reality driven by wants. This is driven by desires or aversions. And here, now I'm experiencing the strong smell, and I'm suffering because I don't want to be experiencing this strong smell. This is where wants come into the equation. The problem isn't that the smell of a skunk is a strong smell. The problem is that I'm smelling something that I don't want to smell. That's where suffering arises. So pain, you know, smelling a, a skunk, there, there may be pain involved. I can't help it that my nose rejects that, that smell of a skunk. But suffering is what arises like the second arrow. That's the second reality. Then there's the third one. The, the world of shoulds, and this is driven by our views and our beliefs. So here now I might be experiencing this thought that, I don't know, skunk, I, I shouldn't live in the country because that's why I'm smelling skunks, because I live out in the country and I should be living in the city. So now I, I'm experiencing a type of suffering that arises based on a view or based on a belief. And maybe the belief is I made a mistake moving to the country. I was always meant to be living in the city. So that's a new form of suffering, and that one arises based on views or beliefs. So looking at these three, again, we have what would be the suffering. You know, in Buddhism, we talk about the three types of suffering, and I've mentioned this in various podcast episodes, but I think I'd like to shift this, at least in my own mind, I have a more clear picture of how all this correlates. So for me, I would say the three forms of suffering now are probably the suffering of sensations, this is the suffering that we experience through sensory stimuli. Bad smell, a cut in my skin, the pain of a really loud noise. My ears can't handle you know, a certain decibel or a frequency. That's the type of suffering due to sensations. Then I have the second form of suffering, the suffering of desires or wants. And, and again, these are the things that I want, and, but, but also the aversions, the things that I don't want. So this is the suffering that we experience when our wants are not met, and it also involves not getting what we do want and getting, and getting what we don't want. So that's the suffering of, of desires or wants. Then we have this third type of suffering, the suffering of views and beliefs. And this is the suffering we experience when the world is not behaving as we think it should be. Now, our views and beliefs influence how we think things should be. And we all have these. We can't help it. We, we have views, we have opinions, we have beliefs. And sometimes, well, maybe not sometimes, oftentimes we suffer because of our views and beliefs. So if you want to have 
a greater sense of inner peace, you do need to understand your thoughts and specifically understand what beliefs or what views drive your thoughts. So I want to talk about a practice that starts to get at the heart of all of this. There is a practice called sky gazing, like gazing, G-A-Z-I-N-G. Sky gazing is a meditative practice that emphasizes resting in a natural state free from conceptual elaborations. And this natural state is wide open and it's clear, very much like the sky. So you can just picture the sky. The sky doesn't reject anything. It doesn't cling to anything and it doesn't reject anything. It's just there. It's a form of complete open awareness. The sky will receive whatever is in it. Airplane flying by, clouds, storm, tornado, hurricane, uh, you name it. The sky is just the open awareness and, and the weather is what comes in. And a clear sky is a good example of, of what this natural state is like. And just like the sky is not affected by passing weather, our own natural state is also not affected by thoughts or emotions, no matter how strong they may be. Now, you may say, but certainly our thoughts and emotions do affect me and my actions, starting with my thoughts. Yes, but they don't have to. Just like the understanding here is that the sky is always going to be the sky. And if you may have a hurricane there, but you look through the hurricane, see past it, and what you see is that natural state, which is the openness of the sky. In sky gazing, as a meditative practice, you don't try to achieve a specific state of mind, or you don't try to alter your thoughts or your emotions or your feelings. You simply observe, and you realize that the sky is one thing and the weather is another. And taking sky gazing inward, you're going to observe a very similar thing. As Pema Chodron says, you are the sky, everything else, it's just the weather. That to me is a fascinating concept, understanding my mind and the way that I try to understand the sky. Just as the sky is the container for all passing weather, my mind is also the container for all passing thoughts, feelings, and emotions. So the key here is, what will I notice when I start to pay attention? Now, this one really speaks to me, this idea of paying attention to the sky. I spend a lot of time paying attention to the sky. I spend a lot of time in the sky. I try to tell my, my students when I'm teaching someone to fly, you're, you're learning a new skill here that is going to take you into a new realm, right? The, the sky is about to become your playground because that's where you paraglide. That's where you spend time in the sky. So it is of utmost importance to probably develop the skill of learning to understand the sky. If that's where you're going to be spending time, then you better understand how the sky works. The sky is not the, the weather, but weather is something that happens in the sky. So let's understand, let's understand the sky. There's a book that I read called Understanding the Sky, and it talks all about weather and what causes weather and you know how to read the sky and how to notice certain clouds and what that means and the terrain and based on the weather and the terrain, you know, being the whole point of this is to be able to decide when is it safe for me to be in the sky and when is it safer for me to be on the ground. Now, that's really important to know as a paragliding pilot. But one of the things I've noticed with new students or new pilots, we don't have an intuitive sense of understanding the sky because it's something that we don't really pay attention to. And when, when they have a new student and they're out there standing in the field, they don't have an intuitive sense of simple things like the wind. Which way is the wind blowing? What strength is the wind blowing? Uh, those are things that you just kind of, unless you really pay attention, you don't know. You're like, well, I can sense that it's windy, but I wouldn't know if it's four miles an hour or eight miles an hour. How would I know the difference? But as you spend time and you observe, you start to become much more intuitive and familiar with the sky and with the wind. Now, in that process of learning, one of the things that we use, we use tools. A really good example of this would be a flagpole or a windsock. You can go to virtually any airport and you'll find a windsock there. 
Well, what is the whole point of the windsock? The windsock is a tool that helps you to understand what the wind is doing. And windsocks, a lot of people don't know this, but windsocks are designed a certain way. If the windsock is all the way out, that tells you the wind is blowing at a certain speed. If the, if the windsock is 75% out or 50% out, that all of that helps you to interpret what the speed is of the wind. Now, in paragliding, we use a, um, not necessarily aviation windsocks because we want to be able to read the wind at lower levels. So we'll sometimes use a streamer. And the streamer just hangs there. You can, I mean, when it, when it stands out, you can read it to know which way the wind is blowing. But the way that the streamer moves will give you a lot of information about the wind. If it just kind of stands out and it's not flailing, it's just like stiff, it almost looks like it's frozen, that's very smooth laminar wind. If it's kind of fluttering, you know, the, the intensity of the fluttering all the way to where it's like you can, you can see and, and hear it as it flutters in the wind, that tells you what type of wind you're dealing with, the, the intensity or the spread of the gusts, because it's not common for wind to just be a fixed speed. It may be that the average wind is five miles an hour and it's gusting to six or gusting to eight. That will look a certain way on the streamer, where if it's five gusting to 10, that will look a very different way on the streamer. The idea here is that you start to pay attention. And as you pay attention, you start to notice. And the more the better you are at paying attention, the better you, the better understanding you'll have of what's happening. And the better understanding you have of the conditions, the more wise you can be with determining, making the decision, should I take off or should I not? In what direction? Which wing should I use? You know, all of those decisions that come into play. Well, that technique is very much what we do in our mind as we start to practice mindfulness. The invitation here, just like we do with sky gazing, if the, if the flag in the field or the windsock out in the field is the tool that I use to watch and, and take an assessment of what the sky is doing, meditation is like the anchor that I put real quick in my mind to notice what is my mind doing. And I think the most basic of these would be breathing meditation. If I start to observe my own breathing, while I'm observing my breathing, I can get a lot of information from what's happening. I can say, oh, wow, I, I, I sense agitation, or I, just like I would with the wind, right? And looking at the windsock. So the invitation for this podcast episode and this topic would be knowing that you can't escape the consequences of your actions and that actions originate with thoughts. The invitation is to spend some time observing your own thoughts. In the same way that you would sitting in a field and observing a windsock and trying to decide what does this say about the wind, or like with sky gazing, go out and just sit and look at the sky and observe and say, based on what I see in the sky, what does this tell me? What, what's going on? I promise if you did that long enough, you would have a very intuitive sense of weather. You, that, that's how you learn that, by observing. And I, I don't mean like, okay, I'm going to go watch the sky for a day and now I'm an expert on the weather. No, but if you go out and you observe the sky, let's say you did this every day, every evening, and you observe the patterns and you observe all the details of what's happening in the sky, and you did this every day for years, you would, you would have an expert understanding of the sky. You would know things about it that the average person would be like, wow, that's amazing. How did you know that? through observation, lots of time observing. That is the, the, I believe that's the key to like the Zen masters and the, the people who have achieved a great amount of inner peace. They have spent a lot of time observing their mind in the way like you would if you were out observing the sky. And what does that do? Well, you, you acquire knowledge. Through knowledge, you acquire understanding. And with that understanding, you develop wisdom. And that is the wisdom of the sages, the wisdom of the, of the masters, you know, is that they've spent a considerable amount of time learning to just pay attention and noticing. So that's the invitation I, I want to leave you with. Noticing your thoughts. I invite you to spend time to observe your own thoughts. Remember, mindfulness is the non-judgmental observation 
of the present moment. It's the anchor to the reality of how things are, right? If you have those three little worlds that you reside in, there's how things are, there's how I want things to be, and there's how I think things should be. Mindfulness is all about awareness. It's not about insight. It's about awareness. It's it's the way that we immediately anchor ourselves in the reality of how are things right now. And that's where you notice. What do I notice? Well, let me pay attention. What do I see? You know, are you the observer of your thoughts? You can be the observer of your thoughts and the one experiencing the thoughts because thoughts are something that's happening to you. This is what I find fascinating. In the same way that my heart just beats, you know, heartbeat is something that's happening to me. Well, mind just thinks. Mind has thoughts and feelings and emotions, and this is something that happens to me. And usually we go about our day-to-day lives as the the habitual react reactivity, right? I'm just habitually reactive to the experience I'm having. Oh, there's this thought. Oh, that thought brings up this emotion. Oh, this emotion reminds me of that memory and that memory, you know, and we just go along. And that's how we live our lives. This is like stepping out of that for a moment and saying, I want to get into the world of just observing how things are. It's just about noticing. So I can be the observer of my thoughts. I learn to pay attention. And then with time, I can start to see what am I noticing and what understanding arises from that noticing. And with that understanding, I develop a sense of wisdom around the nature of my own mind and how my mind works in the same way that I would do looking outside and observing the weather. So that's the invitation for this podcast episode. Paying attention to your thoughts, just observing them like you would the open sky, and notice and see what's there. If you went out and did this right now, looking at the sky, you may notice things that you had never noticed before. Now imagine what would happen if you do that with your own mind. Thank you for listening to the Secular Buddhism Podcast. If you enjoyed today's topic and you want to learn more, visit secularbuddhism.com where I have links to my books, courses, podcast episodes, and information for how to join the Secular Buddhism Podcast community. Thank you for listening. Until next time.